When we talk about the power of God, we're using what theologicals, we're talking about what theological experts, we're talking about a, a concept called God's omnipotence. It's defined as this, having great and unlimited power and ability. Having great and unlimited power and ability. Let me confess to you right now that you could open up the scriptures in any space and see this communicated. Yes? In the beginning, God created omnipotence. Are you with me? Right? You go to the middle somewhere and Jesus turned water into wine. Omnipotence. Right? All throughout the ministry of Jesus, we're going to come back to that, but you can see it in all kinds of places. The end of the story, God is going to return at some point in, our, in, in the reality of time, and he's going to restore all things back to his purposes and plans, and he's going to right every wrong. He's going to wipe away every tear. Everything's going to be as it's supposed to be, yes? By the way, nothing short of the return of Jesus is going to actually accomplish that. His omnipotence. It's everywhere in the scriptures, but this morning we're going to look at it through Psalm 147. So if you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn to the book of Psalms and find number 147. While you're looking, let me give you a little bit of background. Let me give you a little background. All you got to do is Google up when was Psalm 147 written. All you got to do is go into your smartphone. See, we say a lot of things that people go, wow, how did they know that? Internet. Books, reading, thinking, praying. But if you want to just Google when do scholars believe that Psalm 147 was written, you will find out that most scholars believe Psalm 147 was written during the post-exilic return of Israel to the promised land. That's a big sentence. You could use that on your theological paper as well. Post-exilic, remember this, God's people for over a thousand years rebelled against him. And though he sent warning after warning after warning, we're going to do some history. Are you guys okay with that? And we're going to do it like biblical history in five minutes, maybe three. They rebelled against God for thousand, at least formally a thousand years. All we know is it was longer than that. But formally, for a thousand years, God's people rebelled against him. His will, his purposes, his plans. They did almost everything he told them not to do and rarely did the things he told them to do from a pure heart. Okay? And as a result of warning them over and over and over and over and over and over and over, finally in 722 B.C., God sent the Babylonians to come down and take the northern ten tribes of Israel into captivity. And they were taken away. Then in 586 B.C., he sent the Assyrians who had taken over the world power from the Babylonians. He sent them and they took the southern tribes of Judah and uh, the other one, the half tribe of Manasseh. He took them into exile as well. So for 70 years, God's people were misplaced. Just know this. Here's why we bring this up. It's going to frame the reality of God's power, and it gives us the ability to understand how those people would have been feeling. Because from their perspective, any time one of these world powers overtook or took away your people, your people ceased to exist anymore. The reality that Israel was returned to the promised land around 400 or so B.C. and restored to the land is nothing short of God's omnipotent power. It's miraculous. And most scholars believe that Psalm 147 was written in light of their return, a time in which people would have been emotional, yes, can we all agree that it's okay to be emotional in the house of God? It's okay to be emotional in a good way? Woo! That hurt. <laughs> it's also okay to be emotional in a sad way? It's okay to be emotional in any way in between. God's people would have been emotional. There would have been people who survived the exile, who were taken off into captivity and then returned, who thought they would never see their homeland again. And when they did, they were probably overwhelmed with emotions and tears and thoughts and all the feels. Yes? And it's in that light that the psalmist, whom is not, who is not identified, so we could say this, maybe speaking for all of Israel, writes about the power. Of God. 
So when we talk about the power of God, we can look at it from all kinds of different ways. But as we look at Psalm 147, we're seeing it from the perspective of a God who can, who can, who can bring his people back. In fact, if you look at verses 2 through 3 of Psalm 147, that's kind of what the psalmist starts with. He says this, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Know this, the exile is not only a historical reality for God's people, but it's also a thematic challenge for you and I. It's used to communicate. As we remember that historical story, we're supposed to connect that there are times when we are out of place, so to speak. There are times when we have found ourselves in places we don't belong. And know this. How many of you would agree? Sometimes when you find yourself in a place that you don't belong for a prolonged period that God never planned, you can become brokenhearted. Yeah? be it a relationship, be it a, a town, be it a job, be it whatever it is, it's very easy when you're in a space that you weren't intended to be to get brokenhearted. It's easy in those places to pick up some wounds, so to speak, to be hurt emotionally, if not physically. And what the psalmist says is that God has the ability, he has the ability to both build up and restore his people. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel, those who have been dispersed to places they didn't belong. He regathers, right? He restores. He can build them up and restore them. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Though they would remember their past, it wouldn't have to define them forever. The video is going to be shot today. Though they would remember their past because of God's ability to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds, it would not have to define them. It's not meant to be what it has always been. God can change it. This is, when we talk about his ability and his power, we're talking about the ability to not only change the direction of our hearts, but the ability to heal and to help and to figure things out in a way that actually changes us from the inside out. He can build up and bind in a good way. He can be a refreshing to our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our souls. It's not going to be the first time I go down there. Look at verses 4 through 5, 8 through 9, 15 through 18. He also has the ability to both command and control his creation. So this last week there was some stormy stuff, yeah? Right? I heard there was stormy stuff in southern Oregon. I wasn't here. We were over in Sisters, a beautiful place in Oregon that is free from all the stormy stuff. So you would think. <laughs> we were there. And this wind started blowing through and branches started going into the pool and it got crazy. And there was a part of, of that moment where our five-year-old was super nervous. And I forget that, right? Because for me, like I'm an old man experienced in life. In my 54 years, I've seen some wind. And it's not uncommon for those of us who have experienced more to forget that those who have not experienced that stuff, it's terrifying. So instead of just looking at my son and going, don't you worry about it, man up and stand in the store. In Jesus' name. Instead of doing that, I just pulled him close. And I said, hey, buddy, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. These things come and go. If it gets too much, we'll go inside. We'll just keep kind of making our way through it, right? I don't know about you, but creation and the elements, they're downright terrifying. We live in them as if everything is okay. But at any given moment, it's not okay somewhere. And stuff happens, and it's terrifying. And I don't know about you, but as I get older, I get more and more anxious about it. Like, what, like what if a tropical storm hits southern Oregon? Okay, it's, that's not going to happen, probably. 
But at 54, my anxiety, I just go, oh, oh, I'm probably too old to take care of my two little boy. I don't know what's going to happen. You see what happens? You just spiral really quick. These verses are supposed to remind his people, both then and now, that his omnipotence or his power gives him the ability to both command and control creation. Look at verses 4 through 5. He determines the number of stars and gives to all of them their names. There's a part of me as I was studying, I was like, I wonder what those names are. And I went on a, like a 45-minute deep dive that was got, not going to go anywhere. You know what I mean? And so I came back and I'm like, I don't know. I may not know their names, but he does and that's all we need to know. Yes? He continues on and he says, he gives, them, he gives to them all their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Look at verses 8 through 9. He covers the heavens with clouds and he prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. Listen, verses 15 through 18. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down the crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes the wind, his wind blow and the waters flow. What we're supposed to pick up in this poetic language the psalmist is using to help us to understand the power of God. What we're supposed to understand is that he has command and control over all of creation. Where we feel helpless, he's full of hope, yes? Like that's what we're supposed to, that's what they were supposed to, remember they were a society in that time as they return. Their land had been untaken care of for 70 years. And they were a society that had to grow food in order to live. And their ability to do so was contingent on the weather. And so the psalmist writes, hey, I know it's worrisome. And I know it gives us anxiety because it gets really hot and dry for long periods of time. But don't you worry. The God, the covenant God that we are connected with, who miraculously brought us back home, can also command the wind and the waves, we'll come back to that later. Look at verses 10 through 11. He also has the ability to both be unfazed by earthly strength and yet moved by anyone who trusts in him. And the reason why I think this is a power is because I don't know about you, but whenever I see somebody, <laughs> whenever I see somebody that's stronger than me, which is most people, right? I'm blown away. I'm like, whoa, they're amazing. You see what I mean? We have that tendency as humans but God doesn't do that. Look at verses 10 through 11. It says this. His, his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. I, you ever want to write a psalm? Throw in horses and man legs. <laughs> like, I don't know about you, but I've read the psalms a bunch. And this morning I was rereading and I'm like, his delight is not in the strength of the horse. Oh, okay. In their day and age, that would have been the symbol of strength. Nor his pleasure in the legs of man. <laughs> right? I'm like, what? what a, hold on. I guess if they wore tunics, their quads were out. And sometimes you can see them at the Saturday market buying their figs. And dudes would be all like, oh, yeah. Right? And the people around them would have been, oh, did you see so-and-so? Peter got calves. Right? Right? To which John would have said, yeah, because he's running away from everything all the time. <laughs> right? That's, uh, like, he just uses this stuff to communicate that God is not phased. He has the ability to be, remain unfazed by what humanity calls strength. Why? Because he's stronger than the horse and our wimpy little man legs. Never in my entire 30 years of ministry did I ever think I would use the term he's stronger than our wimpy little man legs. <laughs> but you're welcome. However, look at what else he says. But the Lord, verse 11, takes pleasure in those who fear him. Anyone who is moved to trust in him 
moves him towards them. You know what phases God, so to speak, is a humble and contrite heart. Is an inner attitude that is willing to say, I am not all that. It doesn't how, no matter how many stars I got on the board on kindergarten. Doesn't matter how many races I won in the fourth grade. Doesn't matter how many all-star teams I made as a teenager. Doesn't matter how many honor rolls I made in high school at one. It doesn't matter. Like, none of those things, it doesn't matter how much I bench press or how far I can run or what I can do. None of that stuff matters. That doesn't phase the Lord. You know what I'm saying? You know what moves him is a heart that is moved towards him because of his love and mercy. That's what moves God. And in order to be one who is moved by the love and the mercy of God, it requires a humble and contrite spirit. He has the ability to be unfazed by sometimes that which we are often wowed by. Look at verses 13 through 14. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. Think about it. Remember, these are returning exiles who are worried. They're in the promised land, but when's it going to happen again? Because <coughs> we're still surrounded by enemies who want us out at any given moment. So when's that going to happen again? So the psalmist, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, writes, hey, don't forget about God's ability. He has the ability to both protect and provide for his people. And that would have given them hope. Look at verses 19 and 20. It says this, He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Verses 19 and 20. I speak of God's power this way. He has the ability to both lead and guide those that he is in a relationship with. Because when he talks about Israel, when he talks about Jacob, he's using, the psalmist is using covenant language that they would have understood. So those people that God has committed to in relationship, and I'm not talking about willy-nilly junior high relationships that are here today and gone tomorrow. I'm talking about a relationship that says, from God's perspective, I will love you and I will do so forever. And I'm going to give my son to guarantee it. To those, right, he is able to protect and provide for. Which if you're a returning ragtag group of Israelites in the promised land, surrounded by people that want that land and want you out, how meaningful is that? But here's the interesting thing, just so you guys know. We might get out on time, probably not. But just so you know, here's the interesting thing. The most important thing about the omnipotence of God, the power of God, the ability of God, is not necessarily what we get, but who it's pointing to. Yes? The most important thing about the omnipotence of God, especially as we find it in Psalm 147, is not what we get. Protection, provision, right? Restoration, hope, and humility, all of those. It's not that. Although those things are important. Don't get me wrong. Those things are not things. They are things. They're just not as important as what the importance or what the, what the omnipotence of God is pointing to. What it's pointing to is Jesus. Jesus actually personifies God's power perfectly. Are you with me? Perfectly. How many times in the Gospels, this is where we might do this together. How many times in the Gospels do we see Jesus restoring people? Do we see it, do we not see it over and over and over <coughs> somebody tell me. Somebody give me an example. Where's a moment where we see Jesus restoring somebody in the Gospels? Yeah, Pat. The blind man. The blind man. Can't see. It's important for you guys to understand this. It's important for all of us to understand it. In their society, in their culture, you can't see. You're not a normal part of their culture anymore. You don't have the same abilities as anybody else. You can't bring to the table what everybody else brings. And so you are not just not able to see as a result, you are not as a part of the community as you were meant to be. And God, in a moment, whether it's the moment where he spits and he makes mud or he spits and he touches their eyes, in moments that are confusing to us, <coughs> he restores sight. Lazarus. Lazarus. I was holding that one, Steve. Can you just wait? Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Like, it's a thing called preaching and the art thereof. we got to build to these moments. 
so we'll get there, spoiler alert. <laughs> the point is this, though. There are all kinds of moments where God is restoring people. What about the paralytic who was carried to his friend's house or into his friends or into the house by his four friends? What about that? Is that anything? He can't weed. He can't take care of his crops. He can't be, participate in the temple. He can't do anything. And yet God, when he sees him, Jesus, when he's lowered down through the roof, Jesus sees him and he doesn't say, not now. He doesn't say, this isn't the time or the place. He doesn't ask, why did you break the church? You know, you know what I'm saying? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that we put a trap door in the roof. That's not what I'm saying. It's impossible to get up there. We've tried. It's scary. Listen. Instead, he looks at him, and he says, listen. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now rise and walk. First, he says, your sins are forgiven. See, he's a God of restoration. All of these things that the psalmist is bringing up about God in Psalm 147 are perfectly personified in Jesus. We see Jesus restoring the paralytic, the bleeding woman. You remember that story? A woman who's got an issue of blood for some 12 years. She can't, be a, she can't participate in the community like every other lady. She has to sneak incognito, hoping that nobody recognizes her or touches her in the midst of a crowd. She has to sneak, and she doesn't think that he'll give her much of the time of day. So she just thinks to herself, if I just touch his robe, the hem thereof, he'll maybe do something. And so she does successfully. And just at that moment where she's making plans for how she's going to go back to church, just when God does restoration in your life, you should go back to church, just saying. Not because it's required, <laughs> but because of a result of his mercy, there are people that you can connect with and have friendships with like you never had before, right? And just as she's making those plans, Jesus himself goes, everybody stop. I don't think he said it like that. But he says, wait a minute. Somebody touched me. The disciples, completely confused. Lord, there's a massive amount of people here, and everybody's touching you. He goes, no, 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 no. Power has left me. I did something. Now, did he do it for his own benefit or the people around him? I think he did it all of the above, but especially for her benefit. She's going like this. Next week, I'm going to text so-and-so. We're going to go and have coffee before church, and then we're going to hang out at fellowship time, and we're going to be a blessing by connecting with other people. We're going to grow as the message is giving, and we're going to serve the body that I can be connected to now for the first time in over a decade. This is going to be so great. Wait a minute. What? You. Come here. And she's thinking, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. Because I did what the law told me I couldn't do. And Jesus says, oh, I love you. I just wanted you to know. Now, if you go to the Bible and you read it, it's not going to say that. But that's exactly what's going on because that's what his restoration does. Sometimes we're afraid of it because we think that maybe we'll get a long lecture about what we didn't do. Instead, what we should do is embrace it because most likely what he's going to do is going to look us in the eye and he's going to say, I love you. And you're going to go, yeah, but what about? And he goes, I don't really remember that. I just love you. I want you to know that in the knowing part of your knower. And I want that knowing part of your knower to change your life forevermore now. Are we good? <laughs> and then you have the ability to go, we're good. <laughs> and the Lord's going to go, yeah, we're good. Go have fun. Does that make sense? He's got a restoration. It's seen through Jesus. Jesus miraculously controlled the elements of creation in order to help his people. I don't know if you recall, but one of the first things he ever did as it relates to the elements is turn water into wine to help a couple that was hosting a wedding and save them from a little bit of embarrassment. I don't know about you, but in my mind, I'm like, well, that's not really that big of a deal. And it's wine. Come on. Everybody knows. Good Christians don't drink. <laughs> I, I think I, I feel like I have to let you know, like, clearly I was being sarcastic. <laughs> I will say this, good Christians shouldn't get drunk, but instead should be controlled by the Spirit, just so you know. However, he turns water into wine. There's also a couple of other moments where the disciples are in a boat with him, and storms are coming, 
they're freaked out for their lives. And he stands up and he goes, hey, guys, I got this. I feel like if you remade the movie, it'd be good to be like, I got this. <laughs> All the disciples. <laughs> Which might be a really appropriate response. Again, that hurt. We see Jesus perfectly personifying these things. He lovingly engaged those who reached out to him in spite of their lack of power and prestige. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13 says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And Jesus reclined at the table in his house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. We love these verses, but back in the day when it was going on, they hated them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he, meaning Jesus, heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Like Jesus is personifying the power of God that is unfazed by human strength. And in his, instead is moved to engage, be with, and change those who are moved by his mercy and his love. And in a humble and contrite way, just come to him. They're invited to sit and eat at his table. Which, by the way, in that culture, was one of the most meaningful relational things you could do. He selflessly protects and provides for all those who call them their king. In John chapter 10, verses 10 through 15, he himself said this, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, and I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own these sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I, on the other hand, am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. If the psalmist declares that God can protect and provide for his people, then Jesus pers personifies it. He says it himself, this is who I am. And his ministry backed it up. Those three and a half years that he walked the face of this planet, back it up that he was willing to lay down his life for his people. He compassionately leads his followers through some of the most unexpected places in order to bring about some of the most unbelievable outcomes. The psalmist said that God has the ability to lead and guide those he's in a relationship with. And there was a moment in John chapter 4 that Jesus had struck up a friendship with 12 unexpected dudes. And those guys that we know as the disciples and others know as Saint so-and-so. Those guys were walking with Jesus. And in John chapter 4, we're told that one day he tells them, <clears throat> I have to go through Samaria. Now, we're just reading the Bible. If you don't know much about the Bible, you're like, why is that such a big deal? But if you know Bible history, you have to understand that while the exiles, here's some more history. We're going to tie it all in together. You see how we did this? And we did it on purpose. While the exiles were in exile, there were some Israelites that were returned to the promised land. And they were supposed to be there faithfully, only they intermarried with the other peoples that were in that land. They did what they were not supposed to do. And so when the exiles came back and they saw in this area of Samaria these people who turned their back on God and cheated on God, the returning exiles ended up hating the Samaritans because they were half-breeds, because they did what they weren't supposed to do, and they intermarried with the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and they weren't liked very much. Does that make sense? How many of you know that just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's right? It's not okay to hate anyone, no matter what they've done. Side note. And instead, Jesus tells his disciples, we got to go through Samaria to get where we're going. And the disciples are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus, I know you're new on the scene. We don't go through Samaria. Why don't we go through Samaria? We don't like those people. Why don't we like those people? Because they're bad and sinful. <clears throat> If I were Jesus in that moment, I would have gotten the mirror that would be in my back pocket. 
And I, I would have been like, hey, Nathaniel, come here. Nathaniel would have been like, yeah, you saw me before I knew you. You're going to tell me something really cool. And to which in that moment I would say, take a look. <laughs> and I'd hold up the mirror to his face. And I would say, they're sinners. Like this guy? So the disciples follow Jesus. And as they're going, Jesus gets tired. And he takes a seat by a well. His disciples are like, man, he's tired. And he says, hey, go into the village and get some snacks. <laughs> get some trail mix. It feels Middle Eastern, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but the next time you're in Costco and you buy the big bulk bag, just think to yourself, I think Jesus would have eaten this. Unless he had a peanut allergy. And obviously there were no M&Ms. There were M&Dates, but... Go get some food. So they do, and while they do that, the disciples, they return, and they find Jesus talking to a woman. Now, you and I are like, yeah, you go, Lord. But in their culture, rabbis didn't talk to women. Not women at all, but especially a woman like the one he was talking to, because he was talking to a woman who had some issues. She'd been with a number of men, married to a number of men, even though she wasn't supposed to, and then even at that moment was living with one who wasn't her husband. Everybody go, oh. And before you, okay, listen, I want you to do this. I want you to go, <gasps> are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> now I want you to pretend like you're picking up a stone. Ready? Go. <gasps> now I want, you to, I want you to raise it up like you're going to throw it at her. And right before you throw it, I want you to drop it and realize that we're not any better. The disciples are blown away that he's talking to her. They find themselves in the most unexpected place, interacting with an unexpected person, and yet experiencing unbelievable results. Because the conversation that Jesus had with the woman changed her life. That woman, we're told in the Bible, went away and told all of her neighbors, you got to come and meet this man. This told me everything that I've ever done. And the inference is, he's told me everything that I've ever done. And he still loves me and invited me to take a seat at his table. You got to come and meet this man. And we're told that people come. We're told that later Jesus would visit that same area much later. And that small seed that was planted in Samaria on that day at that well was producing good fruit. If God has the ability to both lead and guide and direct those he's in relationship with, then Jesus personifies it perfectly. See, I think Psalm 147 is amazing because it communicates God's power in a way that is applicable in our life today. Not just in a way that says, I'm going to go and I'm going to rah. Like, not, not that. But in a way that touches our hearts and moves our spirits to remember Jesus. To remember this is what the power of God looks like when it's played out, when it's made manifest to the world around us. But here's the interesting thing. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, his power is still seen in the same way. It's still perfectly personified by Jesus. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Darren. I've been paying attention during your Bible studies, and you've told us on regular basises that you say basises when you don't know what to say. You've told us on regular occasions that Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding on behalf of us. Yes, that's true. But the Bible also declares that he's also through his spirit dwelling within us. And I suggest to you Psalm 147 as it relates to the power of God that has the power to restore, that has the power to lead and guide and command creation, has the power to protect and provide, it has the power to do all of these things. Not only am I suggesting that it's praiseworthy, because it will be, but I'm also suggesting that it's still made manifest in the same way. Jesus in and through.